So a Muslim and a Buddhist <laughs> and a Christian and a Sikh walk into the Aspen Ideas Factory. <laughs> Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. You know, this, this conversation today uh, comes at a really critical moment uh, in our time as a country and as a society. And the emergent questions of what we are going to do about religion in our public life, it's never felt more urgent. How are we going to ensure that people of difference have a seat at the table? How are we going to ensure that select few don't impose their religious convictions on the rest of us? How do we ensure that we don't fall into theocracy? These are real questions that we're grappling with today. And here at the Aspen Institute, we're taking these questions very seriously. My name is Simranjit Singh. I'm the executive director for the Religion and Society program here at the Aspen Institute. And I come to this work from a personal perspective. Growing up in Texas as one of the few turbaned six in all of South Texas, religious discrimination and prejudice was part of my daily experience. Being asked not to play in soccer games uh, being kicked out of roller skating rinks. And then 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden I was the enemy everywhere I went. And lest you think that this is a thing of the past, I'll assure you it's alive and well. And I'm reminded of it every time I walk through airport security and pulled aside for a secondary screening because that's the official policy, racial profiling. And that's our government telling us how we treat one another. And I share this perspective with you to shed light on what it's like to be on the other side. And also to demonstrate for you all what is going on in our country, in a world where we aspire to be equal, but we're very far from that, and we know that. I wanna share with you what you read in the guide description for this session. <clears throat> in the US, there are twice as many Buddhists as Episcopalians and an equal number of Muslims as Lutherans. And the median age of Muslims and Buddhists is 20 years younger than their Christian counterparts. Meanwhile, the group known as the religious nuns now makes up one third of the population. America's religious landscape is changing. And while religious diversity is a fact, creating the conditions for true belonging in this country, that's a choice. In our program, the Religion and Society program here at the Aspen Institute, we describe this as religious pluralism. <coughs> How do we create conditions so that everyone can thrive no matter what they believe or how they look, or even if they don't believe at all? It's a vision that many of us share but it's not happening by accident. We have to be more intentional. And so that's why I'm so grateful for you all, to you all for being here, uh, to be part of this conversation today. And I'm especially grateful for this incredible panel. They're not here by accident. We have hand-selected, curated this group because they bring incredible lived experience and professional expertise to this conversation. So I'll introduce our panelists for you uh, we'll move into conversation, uh, and then we'll bring you into the conversation as well. Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, Roshi, if you'd ra raise your hand for us, please. She's the founder of Transformative Change and an author, most recently of Radical Dharma, talking race, love, and liberation. She is the second black woman to hold the most senior title in Zen Buddhism, and a social visionary and entrepreneur who understands inner awareness to be critical to America's next great social movement. To her right and to my immediate left is Austin Channing Brown, a media producer, author, and speaker, providing inspired leadership on racial justice in America. She's the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of I'm Still Here, Black, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness, 
and the executive producer of The Next Question, a web series imagining how expansive racial justice can be. And Ibu Patel, on the left, is a founder and president of Interfaith America, the largest organization specifically engaging religious diversity issues in the United States. He's the author of the new book, We Need to Build, Field Notes for Diverse Democracy, which he will be signing at 3.45 p.m. today in the Ideas Pavilion. And I will reveal my inner nerd by telling you that I have read each of these books that we've mentioned and highly recommend them. <laughs> okay, so we'll begin, we'll begin with the conversation and, and maybe, um, Angel, we can begin with you. Um, this, is, this is true for everyone on this panel. None of us represent what would be considered the norm when it comes to a racial or religious American. And I'd love for you to just help us see what life is like in your shoes. If you would just share, what, what is it that people may not see underneath the surface of what your life is like in this country? Well, I think uh, like many of us, we don't see the intersections. We, there are certain overcurrents of, you know, people can surmise that I'm black and female, um, and uh, underneath that being Buddhist, uh, then I live at this sort of cross-section of expectations that come with being black and female that I defy in many ways. Uh, even being Buddhist and being considered Buddhist and having a title in Buddhism, being a priest, I would actually consider myself spiritual, not religious. And, uh, and that defies a lot of expectations even of our notions of what it means to be religious in this country. And, and then, uh, therefore, how I am uh, understood in conversations and more often how I'm not understood. And so I defy people's imagination <laughs> and expectation of what it is to be Buddhist, uh, what it is to be black, uh, what it is to be religious. And so at, at multiple intersections, uh, people don't know how to make sense of me. Um, and, and, and that actually travels also to being female and, and, and the fact that I'm queer and have expectations there too. And so in many places that we have actually set up conversations and try to create more space for diversity uh, because we, are, we, do, we do not complexify those ideas, because those ideas of, of even how we diversify are based on mainstream paradigms. I'm missed in those conversations, uh, often of a, a footnote or a sidebar uh, that people want to be there because I present something and I re represent something on the surface. Um, but no real understanding, and I want to say no real effort to engage. Uh, and. And so that means um, very much living on the margins of the margins of the margins and, um, and also having enough of experience because I am black and I am female and I, am, uh, and I have grown up in, in America being in this body that I, I still have all of the language, understanding and uh, faculties of, of, of an awareness of that experience and so can speak to that and can bridge that experience. And so I live kind of, um, you know, on, on each side of the, of, the, of the islands, if you will. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm far more interested in how do we create more bridges to people such as myself because there's far more of us than people think there are. Mm. Nibu, over to you. I know you have some experience. Thank you for that. Similar. So a couple things on this. One is I absolutely hear Angel's experience and the articulation of living on the, feeling on the margins of the margins of the margins. Um, I think that that's real and I, and I grew up with anti-South Asian racism. Every time Apu was featured on a Simpsons episode on Sunday night, like I just knew my Monday was gonna suck mm -hmm. at school, right? Um, so there, there is truth to that, number one. Number two, I, I, I want to trouble the question a little bit in two ways, having, having affirmed, I think, a basic truth of it. I'm not sure that there's norms, that there are overarching norms in America anymore. Mm -hmm. If you grow up LDS in Provo, you're in the majority. If you move to Provincetown, you're no longer in the majority. <laughs> if you grew up white evangelical in Columbia, South Carolina, you're in the majority. If you become a literature professor at Columbia University, you're an alien as a white evangelical, right? If you grow up in Dearborn, 
as a Shia Muslim, you hear the call to prayer, the Muslim Adan, over the loudspeaker, literally, like it is flooded through streets. If you move to Dallas, you're a minority, right? So, so things are much more contextual in the United States these days than they might have been 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. But the most important thing I wanna say is that in my mind, I'm the center of the universe. <laughs> and it's because of theology, mm -hmm. right? And, and when it comes to religious identity, you can absolutely be a social minority, but it is very likely that your theology Right, and in the case Muslim theology, in my case Muslim theology, it's this deep knowledge. You were created by the breath of God. You were made his abdan Khalifa, his servant and representative. Your job is to positively engage the diversity of creation. It is the gift that humans were given that angels do not have. And you are meant to constantly recount the favors of your Lord. So whatever social marginalization that there might have been in my life, and, and parts of that are real and hard, and my kids experience parts of that and it's real and it's hard. My dominant personal orientation towards the world is a Quranic orientation which says you were created with the breath of God and meant to do his will. Hmm. Thank you, Austin. Um, well, as the person representing Christianity today, <laughs> 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 Um, I desperately want to talk as little as possible, um, but I, I, I think what is important to say is that um, <laughs> these days when I announce publicly that I am Christian, it is followed by a caveat that I worship a God who stands with the oppressed mm -hmm. because there is a fundamental difference between my Christianity and the white evangelical Christian nationalists who take up so much space in media, um, whether they are being reported on, right, um, or whether it is assumed that they represent all of Christianity, right? And so I, I spend much of my time um, fighting against this notion that all Christianity is Christian nationalism. Right, and that there are entire groups of people who have long worshiped a God who stands with the oppressed, right? Who have long worshiped, um, in, in, in the case of Christianity, a Jesus who was oppressed, right? And so our faith in many ways has radicalized us, not made us more conservative, not um, made us agents who must evangelize, right? But has, who, who has made us agents to produce good in the world, to produce love in the world, produce peace in the world, produce justice in the world. Um, and so yes, it can be a little frustrating these days to <laughs> be a Christian. And I also feel a deep responsibility as a Christian, right? To speak to the ways that there are millions of us who are different. I wanna, I wanna pick up on that thread and, and keep you in the hot seat for a moment. <laughs> um, you know, no religion is immune from these kinds of radicalized viewpoints. And we see it in every tradition, and we see it all over the world right now. I mean, you can look to pretty much any region in the world, and you are seeing the rise of ethno-religious nationalism. And at the same time, what you're describing from your own viewpoint is, is there's a different way of doing it. And so, you know, one observation that I think many of us in this room would have is, Religion can be the most divisive force that we know, and it can be a uniter. Yes. And my question is, what, 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 what does it look like for us to engage religion in a way where it gives us the good, mm -hmm. rather than some of the ugliness we're seeing today? Mm -hmm. Just a small question, huh? <laughs> um, so, so my <laughs> experience is that the white evangelical Christian nationalist has a very fragile religion and a very fragile God, a God that cannot handle complexity, that cannot handle nuance, that is actually relatively small. And um, I think this notion that God is so big 
that God creates space for everyone shouldn't be a hard idea to grasp. But for so long, that white Christian nationalism has been very much tied to power and control. And it is only in releasing this idea that your religion is supposed to give you power and control over everybody, over the government, over the country, over laws, over policy, over, right? It is not until that gets released, right? And Christianity becomes less about power over and more about power with, that it can no longer be threatened by another religion, right? And, and, and in the exact opposite, it becomes welcoming and open and is seeking connection and wants to learn and wants to be educated and is enlivened by listening to the voices of others. Yeah, yeah this, echo, you, this echoes a bit of what you were saying, Ibu, in terms of your own um, Muslim convictions and, and how you see yourself and the world. And you, you write about a, a lo some of these ideas in your new book, and I'd love for you to to share with us some of your perspectives on, on what does it take, what does it look like for religion to be a positive force rather than a divider? So the kind of the, the kind of tagline of the organization I lead, Interfaith America, is, is faith has to be a bridge of cooperation, not a barrier or of division, not a bludgeon of domination, right? And it's actually especially important in the United States right now, the most religiously diverse nation and probably in human history the most religiously devout nation in the Western Hemisphere at a time of religious tension. And that, and so if faith is not a bridge of cooperation, other people will make it bad things if we are not proactive about faith as a bridge of cooperation. And, and bridges don't fall from the sky or rise from the ground, people build them. We need to be very proactive about this. So one of the ways that I go about things, kind of a, a social change theory, is to ask the question, where is it going right? And how do we do more of that? And the truth of the matter is there's a lot of things that are going right when it comes to, to the United States as a religiously diverse democracy. So let me give you a couple of examples of this, right? So six of the nine refugee resettlement agencies in the United States were, farted, were started by, started by faith-based groups. And they spend very little time resettling refugees of their own faith group. Mm -hmm. That's stunning. Right? They were all started to resettle refugees of their own community, but as global trends have changed, and as many of the world's refugees now are Muslim, the Catholic Refugee Resettlement Agency, the highest, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, they spend most of their time resettling Muslims. And actually, that kind of norm, that defines much of American society. So probably 700 of the nation's 25, 2600 colleges and universities are faith-based. Probably 10 restrict their admissions only to people of their own faith. So my dad has a, his MBA from Notre Dame. My mom has her master's in finance from DePaul, two Catholic universities. Just think it's normal that Catholics build universities where Muslims get graduate degrees. <laughs> it's not normal in most parts of the world. It's not normal over in most of human history. But in the United States, a huge part of what I call our civic genius is that particular identity communities, especially faith communities, build institutions inspired by their identity that serve everybody. And that is part of what kind of maintains the reasonable health of a religiously diverse democracy, right? I'll close with this. Um, one of the stories I tell in, in my book, We Need to Build, is uh, uh, a story uh, based on in Mostar, uh, in the nation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And, and uh, it opens with the line, when there is a fire on the Muslim side of Mostar, the Catholic fire department does not respond. When there's a fire on the Catholic side of Mostar, the Muslim fire department, even if it happens to be closer, does not respond. This is a city that is not experiencing hot conflict that is totally divided in, uh, 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 by ethno-religious identity. There are Croat Catholic nightclubs, soccer teams, garbage collection companies. There are Bosnian Muslims nightclubs, soccer teams, garbage collection companies. That's unheard of in the United States, right? Because we just, we are 
uh, we are accustomed to living in a society where the Inner City Muslim Action Network on the southwest side of Chicago partners with the Jewish, uh, Jewish Council on Urban Affairs on a strategic plan and does community organizing trainings at the local black Pentecostal church. I actually think we should cherish that. We should lift it up. We should tell the story. We should strengthen it. Thank you. Angel, you, you spoke about being on the margins of the margins of the margins. Mm -hmm. And so, so being on the receiving end of what religious division and discrimination and inequity can do. Uh, what is your view? Uh, what have you learned about building rather than dividing? Yeah, so one thing I think it's helpful for people to understand is that within the kind of broad spectrum of Buddhism, there's uh, there are, uh, what we say now are heritage or ethnic Buddhists. Ethnic Buddhists used to be the term, terms always change. Heritage Buddhists um, and convert Buddhists. And I'm obviously a convert Buddhist. Uh, and so for the most part, a lot of uh, Buddhists in this country are almost invisible on other than the convert Buddhist, and so uh, we sort of see the imagery of the heritage Buddhist, but the people that have any kind of real voice, especially in terms of politics and uh, uh, who, who are heard from, myself included, are the convert Buddhist, which is its own form of uh, you know, dominant paradigm. Um, and, and largely, convert Buddhists are mostly understood through the marketplace rather than through the religious s sphere. So, so Pema Trodrin and Jack Kornfield, people will be familiar with Buddhist ideas because they come through the marketplace by way of books and uh, thoughts about lifestyle rather than thinking of them as so much as religious. We know about the Dalai Lama, uh, but other than that, a lot of understanding of Buddhism and how it works and how it operates and how it's not like Christianity is lost to most of the American thinking. Um, and so that creates this, first of all, that need to have a caveat, right, before I say anything and to even have people have a quick understanding. Um, but inside of that, because of the ways in which uh, very sp specifically and, and perhaps um, on the more unique end of the spectrum of how we think of religions, uh, Buddhism is also largely non-theistic, and uh, not atheistic, but non-theistic, and that also creates an interesting marginalization inside of a Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic uh, paradigm. And so there are some agreements that exist in lots of interfaith spaces between Christians, Jews, Muslims, Abrahamic religions. Buddhism doesn't exist inside of that. Uh, Sikhism doesn't exist inside of that. And so that creates new interesting things. And even within Sikh understanding and Buddhism, like there's not a God. <laughs> and so uh, for the most part with my religious and spiritual colleagues, when I'm in religious spaces, they don't get me at all. They're just like, I, like we don't understand where, what animates you. What, what is it that gives you a moral grounding? There's a, and, and that speaks to the so-called spiritual nons or the religious nons, is the notion that that's the only place that, e that we can even have spiritual grounding is by way of a, of a god, by way of theocracy, right? By, by way of, uh, excuse me, by way of theology is its own challenge that I'm often having to navigate. Um, what it does give me though is, you said bridges don't come from the sky, we build them. Um, because of where I sit, I'm actually far more comfortable, I think, than lots of spheres in the multiplicity of ideas and perspectives that people come from, rather than situating in, uh, in any kind of singularity of you know, paradigm, of, you know, of, of theology, of Abrahamic. And so uh, the, the, the Buddhists <laughs> get to sit with the compassion of receiving everyone. Um, because it's part of the understanding, but also because it's the location that we're placed in. Mm. Yeah, we, we were talking prior to this session, and I, I teach Buddhist history at Union Seminary in New York, and um, one, of, one of our experiences that we were sharing that, that, you're, that you're bringing up now is um, what is it like to be on the margins and margin, uh, of the margins, and why does that happen? Mm -hmm. And even when sometimes people are trying to be inclusive, the frames that they're using are still limiting and exclusive. Um, and, and so part of what I'm hearing you say is, 
how do we listen to the people on the margins and understand where they're coming from rather than assuming, hey, our way of thinking will include you as long as you, we can fit you into our box, right? That's, that's, that's right in line. I, I, I even ask questions. I mean, Sorry. when you're part of the a dominant paradigm, the questions that you ask are out of your own paradigm. And so even the questions, I begin with questions that I'm like, that question doesn't, I don't exist inside of that question. So I can't even answer because I don't exist inside of the question. It's not even about listening. It's about having questions that, that actually have space for me to inhabit the question itself. Mm. Let, me, let me share an experience I had recently that I think might be helpful for people here. Um, so I, I grew up with three brothers, all four boys, no, no girls, my, my poor mom. Uh, <laughs> and, and while growing up, we were very aware of our racial difference and on the other side of being the other. Um, we never really thought about what it meant to have advantages as men in this country, in this society. And it wasn't until I had daughters, I have two girls now, that I started to recognize my privilege because I was starting to see the world through their eyes. And what I learned through this experience, and I, it's, you know, it shouldn't have to be that you learn this through family members or friends, but that was the case for me. But what I learned through this experience is privilege is not something that is so easy to uncover. You need other people to share their experiences and you need to open yourself up to their experiences in order to see. And so in a society where Christianity is the norm and Judeo-Christian frameworks are the norm, then the, then the question becomes how do we find other people to listen to their stories to understand what is another way of us engaging them? And Ibu, I, I wanna turn this to you because I've heard you speak on this a little bit and um, I, I think this, this connects right into some of your recent work in your book. This framework that we have held on to for, for so long, but not too long, as you've been pointing out about Judeo-Christian, right? America is a Judeo-Christian country. How is that frame, how is, how is that frame helping us? How, how might it serve us? And how might it be holding us back from where we're trying to go? So. Thank you for that, Simran. So, so I, I actually think the history of Judeo-Christian is one of the most interesting histories, unknown histories in the United States. And when I speak on college campuses, I'll often open by saying, you know, <clears throat> when the pilgrims arrived on the eastern seaboard and they dusted off Plymouth Rock, they saw etched in the stone the phrase Judeo-Christian nation. <laughs> <laughs> and all these, like, you know, 19-year-olds who did very well on standardized tests will kind of look at me and they'll be like, did I see that in the, in the SAT? <laughs> And they know something's wrong with that, but it prompts the question. So if Judeo-Christian wasn't etched on Plymouth Rock when the pilgrims arrived on the Eastern Seaboard, where did it come from? Where did it come from? So it actually is basically a civic invention of the 1930s. So just pause and think about that for a second, right? It's not like from, you know, the tablets on Mount Sinai. You know, it, it wasn't discussed during the period of Constantine. It's less than 100 years old. And it wasn't invented because of its theological or historical accuracy, right? I mean, like, Jesus is the center of the, lives, of the faith lives of Christians. My Jewish friends are like, Jesus, good rabbi, maybe. Let's discuss, <laughs> right? It's, it's not a theologically accurate phrase. But the 1920s was a time of really ugly anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism and anti-black racism also, right? One of the responses to, the, to that ugly anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism, let's just focus on the religious bigotry for a moment, was a group of interfaith leaders emerge. They call themselves the National Conference on Christians and Jews. They run a bunch of programs like this with Protestant pastors, Catholic priests, and rabbis, right? It's the time of World War II, and so the United States government has a vested interest and Catholic Protestants and Jews not being in e at each other's throats within the U.S. Army. So they start doing presentations across military installations across the world, 772 presentations at military installations. And they realize you can do activity after activity after activity, but what you really need is a new narrative. You need the nation to see itself differently. The nation saw itself as a Protestant nation. In fact, great little story. FDR, the great liberal lion, once said, America is a Protestant country. The Jews and Catholics are here under sufferance. Okay. So what the NCCJ does, in addition to its activities, et cetera, 
is it invents a term. It makes it up. That term is Judeo-Christian. And my general view is it did good work for 80 years. Like, I believe in steps forward, right? Like, somebody 100 years from now is going to be like, that Ibu guy, man, he was a cretin, you know? <laughs> I'm just trying to make a step forward in 2022. And in 1935, these people took a step forward. It's a lot better to be Jewish or Catholic in America in 1990 than 1930, right? Judeo-Christian was a step forward. Okay, it's outlived its sell-by date. It's time for the next chapter. But I'm not mad at the last chapter. I'm grateful for the last chapter. I want the new chapter to include angel. Mm -hmm. I want the new chapter to include secular humanists. I want the new chapter to include Ismaili Muslims, right? I think that new chapter is called Interfaith America. And I think that it includes everybody from atheist to Zoroastrian and the variety of shades of, of religiosity and secular seeking in between. And it's mostly about how people who orient around religion differently get along cooperative, cooperatively and do good things in American life. Austin, you've, you've done some good work in the inclusion world. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's, let's think as Ibu's challenging us to think of a new framework, what's the next chapter for America as we think about religious diversity? What would you like it to look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I really see it as my responsibility as someone who is often in Christian spaces, i.e. Christian colleges, preaching at churches, so on and so forth, is really to challenge this idea of dominance, of control, and of power, and to insert a little humility, just a little bit, <laughs> a little humility, um, and to reckon with a very similar history, right, that... Um, Christianity has been used both to oppress and to free. And it is now our decision, our choice to decide, are, are we going to repeat the past? Are we going to try and subjugate all over again? Or are we actually going to live into freedom? You know? And I, I, I think it's an, an, a really important responsibility because particularly right now, there is a deep desire to continue that Christian nationalism on college campuses and in churches and by banning books and right. All, there are various ways in which Christian nationalists are desperate to hold on to this idea that we are a Christian nation, we were founded in Christianity despite the fact that there are a whole lot of us black people and other ethnic minorities who are like, <laughs> Christianity, huh? <laughs> that same one that said I had to be a slave, that Christianity, you know? Um, and so I think it is the responsibility of myself and of people like me to begin to, to continue to challenge those notions every chance that I get, in addition to opening up space um, for other voices because because my own, my own moral and ethical and spiritual center is strengthened by the questions I would otherwise never ask, you know? And I think if we say that we care about freedom in this country, that must include religious freedom. I have no interest in making whatever I believe a public policy for everyone else to follow. And it's my responsibility to say so. Angel, you are a living embodiment of uh, paradox. It might be a way to say it, right? People have to grapple with their assumptions when they meet you. And they can't deny your existence because you're here. So, so they have to change their, their understanding or their assumptions. And so my question to you, you know, your last book was called Radical Dharma. And, and it seems to me that moving into a next chapter, as Ibu was just requires radical imagination. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say would really create a new type of category, a new type of frame maybe, that would be radically inclusive for, for all of us here? Yeah, actually the name of Radical Dharma is the book is uh, Radical Dharma was meant to do that. We, rather than uh, use a, <laughs> a troubled uh, English word, truth, Dharma has lots of different meanings. One of its core meanings is universal truth. So radical means complete, and and, and dharma simpler, oversimplified, hypersimplified, not is is truth. 
So that's the, the intention, is to say, like, how can we have a more complete truth? Um, I, I, I think in many ways that uh, Buddhism kind of gets to be the Trojan horse in the religious conversation because the, uh, the core tenets that it, that it espouses will show up in our uh, progressive, liberal, or, or, or otherwise inclusivity-seeking spaces, curiosity, connection, and compassion that those things are gonna show up in order for us to uh, be able to function as a, uh, plural, a, a plural society, a trans society. We are trans faith, we are trans religious. It's not just that we're multi, we're like trans. We actually cross bridges. We're holding dual identities, triple identities, tr uh, multiple locations in society. We are mixing in all sorts of ways and so I'm not interested in people becoming more Buddhist. I mean, I'm interested in being able to have uh, conversations that allow for curiosity, our curiosity, our sense of connectivity and being interconnected, which the <laughs> pandemic has certainly shown us, um, and having more compassion, because I don't think the intention is how do we agree about our religions, right, but how do we show up and learn the skills and capacities and deepen our capacity to behave in ways that allow for unanswered questions and let those questions be where they are, and then we still find ways to treat each other as as human and uh, with a sense of kindness and a commitment to be able to advance the positive aspects of the of our great experiment mm -hmm. uh, that we call United States of America together. Thank you, thank you. I, we have some time. I want to invite you all into the conversation. If you would kindly raise your hand, <laughs> I see one up here at the front, and if you don't mind just waiting until the microphone arrives to you and share your question. Thank you, and thank you for this discussion. Um, I'm asking this question as somebody who was a deist, but who grew up the first 18 years of my life in a white evangelical nationalist church and community. Don't ask me how my black parents got there. <laughs> they can't even answer the question. Um, so my question is, we know that humans um, are innately, we have an innate like me bias. We look for, to build with folks who are similar, who are like us. And my question is, how do we use religion and spirituality to build, not even rebuild, but to build a new notion of community that is interwoven, that's interwoven with identities and, and religion and pulls out, brings out the best of what we all believe, that the hope, the charity, the, the basic love of humanity. How do we go about doing that? Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to say, I think that our notions of, and I think that that's part of the, uh, the overriding divisions that exist in this country, I think that you know we're seeing in a lot of spaces that the notion of what what like us means is 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 completely uh, changed, right? That it's not it's no longer just uh, we have the same religious beliefs, right? It could be across gender, it could be across sexual orientation, it could be across ice cream, uh, you know, what flavor of you know vanilla ice cream you like or mm -hmm. chocolate ice cream or whatever it may be. So I think that th I think that that change, I think that. The, the, this ba there's a basic idea of difference as something that used to define what we're threatened by versus difference, something that illuminates us mm. and enlightens us and, and actually creates more sense of curiosity, not just about the other, but also about ourselves, that we are more yes. informed by difference. I know more about who I am and how I be in the world as a result of difference rather than it being a threat. I think that that is actually the big significant split that we're having now in this country where the frail uh, image of God is being threatened by that sense because that difference is a threat rather than that difference for many of us that live in places you know, on the coast and so on uh, that have complexity where we're having access and we're touching the complexity of relating to our daughters and so on are actually finding that we're more illuminated. I actually think it's an evolutionary arc and that we are in the liminal space, the in-between space of shifting the paradigm of how humans relate to that core question of what, how do we measure difference and what does difference mean to us? Is it a threat or is it something that we actually aspire to uh, have us become more informed? Uh, I, th I think if we can uh, change that narrative that we are gonna be in a very different location very soon. No, I think um, 
I find that super important, and I think an important element of that is to recognize that diversity is not just the differences you like. If, if you're proactive about diversity, you are proactively engaging people with differences you don't like. Now, there are limits, okay? I'm not buying a brownie from the KKK bake sale. <laughs> but I'm talking to people who voted differently than me. I'm, I am interested in how they understand the world on their own terms. Because if I'm around people who just agree with me on everything, right, like the top 10 or 15 issues in American life, if I'm around people who agree with me on those things all the time, that's, that's not how I think about diversity, right? I'm, I'm super curious about the worlds of people that I don't understand and that I don't really like. That, that's what it means to live in a, in a diverse democracy, right? It's, it's the ability to disagree on some fundamental things and work together on other fundamental things. And if you're not disagreeing on some fundamental things, then you live in a homogenous nation. One question up here. So um, the piece you mentioned about uh, the narrative um, and changing our narrative, I wonder with our current narrative and the majority of our lawmakers being of a specific religion, do, two part question, do you think diversifying the religious equity of our lawmakers will help and how do we do that? So ju just to, I think there's an interesting, let me just trouble the question a little bit, right? Uh, so for centuries in American life, Catholics were virtually barred from public office, particularly the presidency, right? Um, and Joe Biden is a Catholic president, and there was zero controversy about his Catholicism except for some conservative Catholic bishops. Part of what I'm saying is that for a long, long time, Catholics were considered part of, they weren't Christian, they were part of a totally different religion, and it is actually a positive change in American life that they are considered part of the mainstream now. So when a group is profoundly excluded for centuries and centuries and then becomes mainstream, that's progress, that, that's an improvement. There was actually a time during the Obama administration when the president was black, obviously. The entire line of presidential succession was Catholic, Joe Biden, John Boehner, John Kerry, and six of the nine Supreme Court justices were Catholic. And my point is 50 years ago, that would have been totally unfathomable, totally unfathomable. But in 2009, 2010, when it happened, nobody, nobody even batted an eye. Right? So, I, so there are things, there's progress that's made in American life that, we're, that we ought to be attentive to and frankly proud of. And I think that that's, that religious diversification in, a, in, in American politics is a part of it. I certainly see it happening when it comes to other religious groups also. We'll take one last question. Can I just say something there? I, I think that you know, this is the paradigm question, right? And so um, from the Buddhist view, the notion of like the, the, uh, the correlation of power and and our practice and our, it, like doesn't exist in, in the paradigm. The, so there isn't seeking after power in that way from the, from the Buddhist perspective. It's almost anathema. And so it, it, we don't fit in the paradigm of like, oh, what we're gonna do to assert our uh, you know, Buddhist rights is we're gonna go get a, lo a location of power in office. So we exist outside of the paradigm in that way, because that's actually a part of the way that this country understands the, how you get power, not how we're operating. And so I don't know if it works um, in that sense, but I think the diversity of it overall does help. Um, I'm curious about if it creates more tolerance, right? Um, and I'm, I'm far more interested in the ground than I am in the trees. I have a lot of power as the moderator, but not so much that I can give us more time. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I, I saw a number of hands up. To me, that indicates we're having a really important conversation. I'm grateful that we're having it here at the Aspen Institute. 
I'm grateful to the three of you, not just for being here, but for the work you all do in the world and, and living what you're, what you're saying up here. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you all. Thank you.